Well, all right, welcome to week three, and this is going to be a lecture one. Uh, so far, we've explored and we've embraced. Now, in week three, we're going to start talking about shifts. If we're going to take seriously this journey of, of establishing within the context of our culture, of a church or an organization, this call to be a part of God's missional movement, then there are certain shifts we're going to have to be making along the way. Now, though this week is entitled shift, I, I don't think it will comprise the whole of all of the shifts that will be necessary uh, for us to make. I, I hope that you've had a chance to or that you will take time to listen to Brad Briscoe's interview. It's an incredible interview that I think really helps to fuel the missional imagination. And the missional imagination is something that I take very seriously. I believe that the, the Spirit of God has given us the capacity to dream dreams and to be creative and to be innovative in ways uh, that we might not otherwise be. That, that's the way the Spirit of God moves. God is not a once and for all creative God. God is an ongoing creative God and he has called humanity to join him in his co-creative labors. And so my hopes and prayers are, as you begin to listen to Brad, as you begin to make your shifts this week, as we begin to make our way throughout the rest of this coursework, that there will be a fueling of a missional imagination. You'll begin to think about your church, your organization, your community, your leadership differently than maybe you have in the past. Because that's going to be absolutely vital and necessary for us to make the necessary shifts uh, moving forward. So I want to talk to you a little bit about the expectations of this week. Uh, this week, uh, we're going to talk about organizational change and adapt adaptivity uh, require intentional shifts. And we're going to talk about the shifts that we're going to make from stagnant to dynamic, from bulky to nimble, from internal survival to external engagement. And then we want to also talk about the ways in which our organizations and our churches uh, recognize, uh, communicate, and embody the vision, mission, values, and behaviors of that church or organization. So we're going to be uh, talking about all of this. This is going to lead us eventually to an organizational assessment uh, that we will talk about in our final lecture. Let's jump in through talking about um, the disruption mindset by Charlene Lee. I, I hope at this point many of you have had a chance to read the entire, entire book. If not, I would really encourage you to do so. I know that the ones who are taking this class for credit you have, in fact, read the book and you've written your paper by this point. Now, I am going to spare you covering the entirety of the book. You've read it, you've wrestled through it, um, and perhaps as a part of our conversation when we get together in week five uh, for that Tuesday night conversation, we can make space for an extended conversation uh, about the book, The Disruption Mindset. Perhaps we can do it then. But I do want to relate this book in terms of what we're going to be talking about throughout the course of this week. There's a great quote. You can look at your PowerPoints, and I love this. Disruptive transformation is so difficult because it upsets the status quo and it shifts power relationships. And I think we need to keep that in mind, that much of the pushback that we get in our churches and organizations regarding the kind of disruptive transformation that is going to be required to move us forward into the future is that it unsettles everything in including the structures of power and how power has existed in that church and that organization. Now, I want to give the benefit of the doubt to suggest that not every bit of power is this prideful, arrogant, egotistical preservation of my preferences. I, I want to give the benefit of the doubt. Um, I want to suggest that some people have been invested for a long period of time. They've, they've been typically the ones who have been steadfast and stayed, even when there's been pastoral transitions. They've called the shots, and they've, they've seen it as a holy endeavor. And now that we're talking about disruptive transformation, the kind of adaptive change that will be necessary moving us forward, it's going to threaten their place in the organization, which has been for them settled. Uh, and, and it requires not a settling uh, for the table that has been set for us in the past and instead committing to run toward a future that is radically different and better than where we are today. Um, I think there's some assumptions made there that, that we probably need to work through uh, because there will be those in our organizations that won't see the future that we're leaning towards as better than it is today or even it was yesterday. In fact, it, it's going to be embraced as, as fearful oftentimes. Now, in your next slide, I want you to look at this first church of the blank. And, and, and the reason why I do this is because I think that we can draw some inferences across the range 
of first churches or, uh, you know, the, 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 the sort of the, the steadfast stayed church that's been there in the community for a long period of time. So I, I, want us to, I want us to talk a little bit about why we picked the book, The Disruption Mindset, and what is it possible for us to learn from the business world. And I'm making a case for you for analogy. Now, I, when I first uh, came to Christ and when I first became a minister of the gospel, I became a theological purist. I didn't want anything to do with the business world or corporate leadership, um, anything that was coming that was outside of the, the purity of a Stanley Hauerwas or Jürgen Moltmann or, or any number of different uh, theologians of the time. That was until I made the shift from being on staff to being a, a leader at the church and I realized that some of those principles that I hadn't been paying attention to were now pressing upon me because I was still in some respects charged and held responsible for helping move a group of people into God's purpose for that congregation in that community and that required some leadership skills. So I found myself reinvesting myself in 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 maybe sectors of of the community that I had avoided at times. And so so one of those would be business. And so I I I read a lot on business leadership, not because I believe that ultimately it is the end-all, be-all of what we need to understand ourselves to be, but because I think it's helpful. So, and I say, when we when we see truths of, of the implementation of creativity that falls outside the immediate realm of the church, we must, and what I mean by that is, is when we look at the business world and we see analogies to be made, we must first assess its validity. Um, is there a case to be made for the analogy? And, and, and I think that's where I find disruption mindset incredibly helpful. Uh, we have to creatively reappropriate it, right? It's, it's rarely a one-to-one -one fit. Um, we have to contextualize it. We have to exercise a bit of hermeneutics in the way in which we translate that business book into the realm of, of our world. We, we need to recognize that the cosmological shifts that we talked about last week also affect the business world. In fact, sometimes the business world is quicker to jump on it than we are. So this idea of chaos and complexity, we're not the only ones being affected by it. You're seeing shifts in hierarchical structures in corporations based upon the cosmological structures that we talked about last week. You, you can think about the difference between uh, someone like a Jack Welch uh, or a Lee Iacocca to someone who structures Google or Amazon, right? We want to think in terms of the different kind of organizations that come in the midst of complexity and, and chaos. Um, we, we want to only embrace those concepts that aren't in direct opposition with the unique narrative of scripture. And we want to value discussions of leadership from a variety of dis different sources, recognizing that every lesson learned extends our frame of reference, our set of competencies, and our capacity, even if the lessons are chastened by our unique call to the gospel and the practice of our faith. And so for me, as we think about the church world and the business world and an analogy to be made, I want to say that many of the first churches that are around our uh, around us or that we are pastoring or we have pastored are like the Kodak of the church world. Now let me talk to you a little bit about what I mean by that. Kodak for a long time believed that they had robust market presence. And what I mean by, remember last week when we talked about the difference between robust and resilient. Kodak was the leader in photography. It was the, they had set the market standard. They dominated for decades the, the market and, and they had this robust presence. We will not be moved. We are photography. Their presence in the market was taken for granted. Now they were they were becoming increasingly aware. They, they weren't they weren't inept. They weren't incapable of seeing the technological changes. In fact, some of their own people had had been some of the first to discover some of the technological changes in terms of digital photography. And they were a little bit quick on the front end, but a little bit slow at appropriating the changes for digital photography, but there was never full buy-in because they just assumed that their product, whether it be the, the chemicals and, and the film and the way in which we took photography, uh, that this was just going to be the way it is. And that digital may be an addendum, but they couldn't foresee the kind of paradigmatic shift that was coming. And because they saw themselves as robust, instead of a resilient corporation that needed to learn how to adapt in the midst of, of changing technologies and changing ecosystems, 
uh, they would eventually lose that market share. They would come crashing down, and Kodak is not the Kodak that it was in the 1960s and the 1970s. I tend to believe that that is very similar to what the, the church has experienced. Um, the first church on the block, right? That first church, that, that, that hallmark church that we sort of hold up and say, this is the church that has existed for a hundred years. Um, there's assumptions about its own robustness. Now we talked about that the big C, the capital C church is the robust church, but every localized expression is an outpost and is called to be resilient. But these first churches, these 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 legacy churches, these hallmark churches, these churches we've pointed to throughout the years, we, we see them as robust. We've we've always been here. We're we're a hundred years old, and we aren't going anywhere. Uh, now they may have even made some technological adaptations along the way, uh, but just as though film and chemicals will be the way we do things, there are still methodologies, programs, and practices that they believe will never change, and so they just continue to do what they've always done regarding. Now, unfortunately, many of these first churches are experiencing a decline in market share, which we interpret that to mean the influence of the community and the number of people that, that are being drawn to the message that these first churches proclaim. Uh, and, and too often what I see in these first churches, again, because of their legacy, because of their robustness, because of the assumptions that they've made about their presence in the community, we're just going to double down and wait for the world to come back to us rather than adapt in the ways that are necessary to see transformation take place. And the truth is what it has left us with is a lot of empty warehouses. And, and we need to contextualize that. I mean, I want to talk about Codex empty warehouses, but, but I want to say that many of our first churches, these big glorious buildings, the pillars out front, are sitting at maybe a third of the, of the, the, the congregation that, that once would have visited there. Todd Bolsinger goes on to say this, we go back to what we know how to do. We keep canoeing even when there's no river. At least part of the reason we do this is because we resolutely hope that the future will be like the past and that we already have the expertise needed for what is in front of us. I want to talk a little bit uh, about the disruption mindset and resilience, but we'll pick that up in the next lecture.